Okay, I think we're going to get started with our first panel of the day. Hello, hello, hello. Good morning again. Yep. So uh, we'll get started with our first panel, and I will hand this over to Dr. Mayor Clark. All right, good morning, everyone. How's everyone? Doing well, great. Um, we first want to thank the organizers of this year's symposium for having us as panelists. We've all said to one another that this has been such a well-organized, well-thought-out, intentional event, and we really appreciate um, you having us participate. We are going to introduce ourselves, so I'll allow the panel to go in alphabetical order, and everyone will tell you who they are, where they're from, and just a little bit about what they do. Hi, um, I'm Melissa Brown. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Maryland studying sociology. Uh, my research focuses specifically on how black women use social media. Uh, initially, I looked at how black women use Twitter for hashtag say her name, which is a movement against police violence. Uh, and I decided for my dissertation to shift to Instagram. And now I'm looking at how black women, sex workers, specifically uh, women in the strip club, uh, use Instagram as a site of erotic labor. I've forgotten everyone's last name, so I'm <laughs> cutting the line. Um, <laughs> I'm Alyssa Collins. I am a graduate student at the University of Virginia. I study English literature, and mostly I write about um, the ways in which 20th century and 21st century um, novels align with their kind of white scientific um, uh, discourses. So I read about like how Ralph Ellison is actually also writing about um, technology and cybernetics at the same time as like cybernetics is developing itself and how um, these are different kind of avenues um, and ways to think about technology. So I think the reason I'm on this panel is I go into the 21st century and write about how different um, uh, science fiction writers like Nadia Korfor are thinking about um, communication and how that seems to align with digital practices that we see in the real world. Hello everyone, I'm Katherine Knight Steele. I'm an assistant professor of communication at the University of Maryland and I also direct the Adhum Initiative, which is the African American Digital Humanities Project. Um, my own research focuses largely on African American discourse online. Um, so I've done a bit of work with the African American blogosphere setting specifically how counterpublics, enclaves, and satellites are formed online, how the affordances of platforms um, shift um, users' intentionality, and how they migrate between different forms of discourse in order to accomplish different goals in those spaces, and also about the transference of black oral culture from offline spaces to online spaces. Um, more recently, I've been working on my manuscript on digital black feminism, interrogating how the history of black women's interaction with technology um, puts them in position to um, utilize uh, social media platforms in ways that are surprising to some people for some reason, but shouldn't be surprising after all. Um, and as a part of my work with the Adhum Initiative, we work with uh, the University of Maryland campus and the surrounding area to put in conversation the fields of digital humanities and African American history and culture through a series of uh, examinations and trainings and uh, supports for those who are doing research at that intersection. And as mentioned, I'm Meredith Clark. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Virginia in the Department of Media Studies. I'm a journalist by training and a social scientist uh, in the realm of academia. My focus is on race, media, and power. And I specifically study black online community formation and discourse. Uh, my focus right now, it, it is drawn from my dissertation on black Twitter. If anyone had ever told me I'd be working with this material seven years on, um, I never would have believed them. But I'm working on defining and theorizing black Twitter as the discourse as engaging in black digital resistance. So creating counter narrative to mainstream media narratives of black life in America. So we have three questions, three primary questions for our panelists today. Um, we're looking forward to having a conversation with each of you hearing about your work and some of the needs that you have, some of the experiences that you have. To get us started with the first question, I'll ask you a little bit about your projects in context, and I'll kick us off since I was told I had to talk. <laughs> um, 
They say you are never as smart as you are uh, the day before you defend your dissertation, right? You are as smart as you are going to be. So moving out a couple days ahead of that, August 9th, 2014, I was sitting in my apartment in Durham, North Carolina, and playing around on Twitter, not preparing for my dissertation defense, which was that Monday. And I saw a hashtag go up on Twitter, a hashtag about Ferguson. And then I saw a hashtag about Michael Brown. And I stayed glued to my laptop and to Twitter as the events in Ferguson unfolded that August 9th, 2014. And the haunting, terrifying thought that I had at the time as I watched the hashtag trend was that some of my colleagues were going to see what was happening simply as data. I've been spending, at that point, four years working with black Twitter, um, paying attention to the way that we have conversations, what we talk about, what is signaled within those conversations, and what mainstream media missed. And so my concern was, how do we look back at this data and render it as something other than hashtags and signals to one another? How do we talk about what is below um, what we see in terms of bits and binaries and pixels and whatnot. How do we talk about the conversations that are being had there? So that's my link to what Documenting the Now does, um, thinking beyond just the data itself and getting really into the story there. And so I'll ask each of the panelists to tell us a little bit about what you're working on now and how it relates to um, Doc Now's mission of capturing this data and thinking very fully and accurately, inclusively about what data we capture and how we use it. Um, so I was having this conversation um, at lunch yesterday with someone about the way that um, I capture data, right, or the way that data is captured on black folks online and how my thinking about this has um, changed over time in terms of how I archive information to look at later versus how I interact with it in the moment that it's happening. Um, and the con consistent kind of tension I feel between um, liking tools that allow us to archive data to look at later and to archive conversations and discourse that we can process later and what is missed in that process of not being present in the conversation as it's happening and not being connected in some way to the conversational participants as it's happening. And um, I likened it to an experience offline that I had, but this is what I try to do with online research is try to remind students and others as much as that, that we know about the ethics of doing research we already know in some ways. Um, so I attended a Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago, which was Jeremiah A. Wright's church uh, on the South Side during the presidential campaign. That's my church home. That's my pastor, right? And so when that was happening during the 2008 election, um, that was a moment where that church became a hot ground for national attention, right? Camera crews, people coming in, bomb threats, all the stuff, right? But it was my church home. It was not a site for data for me, right? It was where I went with my family. It is where things that were of consequence happened for me. But I think about that in relationship to the sites that I study online and what those sites are and how they are meaningful to the people who are participating in them and how I would want someone to enter my church home to have uh, to do research, mm -hmm. which would be OK to do. Right. It would be OK to write stories about what was happening in that church. It would be OK to do research at that site. But there is a way to do that that would honor what that site was and what it was for the participants who were present there. And so when I think about my work in the blogosphere, for example, as places that are very public places, places that people can actually get to without a code to enter, without typing in a login name, there's no wall that's restricting access, but there is an understanding among the participants oftentimes of what that site means and who is present and who is not, and who is viewing and who is not. Um, and so I'm reminded as often as possible that the tools that we have access to may allow us to gather much more information and to access it at a later time, but they should not necessarily change how we interact with the people that, whose information that we're accessing, with the kind of nuance that we bring to our research that allows us to see this, as you said, as potentially data, because I don't think data is necessarily a bad word, right? But as also more than data. I am someone's data point. 
right? But I am also a full human being. And those two things can exist at the same time. And as researchers, we can hold both of those things simultaneously. Um, I think I have a similar story to Meredith as I was studying for um, kind of our oral exams, which you like sit a lot, you have a lot of books. I don't know, I read so many books, I can't even really remember. Um, but I found that um, this like work that I've been doing, social media has helped me connect to prior historical times and helped my students connect to them as, in addition to like fictional times. I think um, a particular time that I'm, I'm thinking about is I was reading Invisible Man and the Invisible Man gives this really long um, obituary, or not obituary, but talk about his friend who has just passed away, and he keeps just saying his name and, like, what it is, right? And it's so interesting to me that, like, these practices, like, these vernacular practices are things that we also see online and are very consistent. Um, and, yeah, so I, I like looking at those and thinking about kind of, like, the humans behind them and the past humans behind them and the past humans behind those practices um, and how they kind of mutate or remain the same in the digital space. Um, so that's kind of what I've been thinking about. Um, trying to reflect on how I got to the specific project. So I actually wanted to study black women or black women in strip clubs when I first got to graduate school. Um, and I had even written up a, a project uh, revolving around that, that kind of fit in the typical sociological framework of like uh, ethnography. Um, and I had written out and everything and I got the advice that, oh, it'd be too much to do that study um, before your master's thesis, which is what you should be focusing on <laughs> when you first get into grad school. So I kind of tabled it. And then I think two years later, I opened up a journal and I swear to you, it was the exact same study <laughs> that I had wanted to do. And even the conclusions that the person drew uh, were very similar to what I had like thought would potentially happen, which basically my argument was about the idea that um, black strip clubs and white strip clubs have different processes of financial transaction, and um, it's tied to how black men and white men perform masculinity. Um, and like I said, someone published that study, and I was like, okay, <laughs> go back to your original idea and think about uh, how you too can use the tools that you've learned for years from entering this space um, to have that conversation of black women in strip clubs. Um, so I think it was like my, either my last course or my second to last course was intersectionality with uh, Patricia Hill Collins. Um, and so I had a meeting with her and she said, write about what you're angry about. And so I thought a long time about what makes me angry. And I realized, you know, I'm angry about the fact that as a black woman, someone will call you a hoe just because you're a black woman. Like they don't know anything about you. Uh, but society has primed them to hypersexualize you and take away your sexual agency. And so I thought, okay, now I know that I'm angry about that. Well, how do I channel that into a productive research question? Um, and so I started to think about um, Instagram and how black women in particular have been using Instagram to kind of forge new beauty standards, right? Like non Eurocentric beauty standards um, and how I guess, groundbreaking that was. And so it made me think about, well, what if I focus specifically on black women strippers uh, who use Instagram and what they say and what they talk about about being sex workers in the 21st century? Um, and once again, that went back to the idea of like, I'm angry about the fact that uh, the only people who really get to talk about black women sex workers are rappers, black male rappers. And they obviously don't put out a very favorable uh, portrayal of these women. So I felt like Instagram was a good space for me to be able to go and uh, have these women talk for themselves. Um, but I also didn't limit it to a digital analysis because I think documenting the now helped me realize that you can't just do, you know, a bunch of uh, coding of tweets or whatever have you, that there are humans behind the text. And so I also decided to make sure that I created a survey and a interview guide to go beyond these women's portrayal on social media to really talk to them about their agency. Like I really just wanted to have a conversation about black women's sexual agency. And I really thought that uh, Instagram was a really great way to do it. So can I just add that I think what's interesting when I whenever I listen to Melissa talk about her work and I listen to Sarah talk about her work or I listen to Meredith or a lot of folks talk about her work is that I mean the question is still supposed to guide us right and and I think that that gets lost sometimes in what we have the capacity to do is that 
the question, this is what we teach our graduate students, right? The question is still supposed to guide your method, is still supposed to guide what you're doing. And so there are occasions upon which I am not actually interested in delving into the backstory of why a person posted a tweet at a particular moment, because that's not the question that that work necessitates, right? Like, so when I am dealing in public discourse and what is put out into the ethos for people to like have a conversation about, there are approaches to research that sometimes necessitate getting into the um, moment of when that person posted and where they were and how they were feeling about it and what they meant by it and all of those things. And there are moments that don't call for that based on the questions that we're asking. And so I really am happy about the conversation that we have about ethics in our work and about respecting the folks that we're engaged with. But I don't want that conversation to supersede what I think is good research across the board, which is here's my guiding question, here's the method that then propels me to be able to answer that and hear the ethics that I carry no matter what kind of research I'm doing with whomever I'm doing it right that allow me to know how to approach whatever new research project I embark in right so when I was studying the blogosphere I did not go to the bloggers and say hey I am archiving your blog right now and I'm going to be writing about it because that's not the game there, right? Like I was not trying to make myself a known entity. I was a part of those communities already. Um, I was a commenter in those spaces. I was an accepted part of those spaces and I was going to write about them in ways that was not going to say, look at this terrible thing that's happening. Let me draw attention to something that is going to make these folks' lives miserable and say that they're doing something wrong. What I was interested in is how black, black folks did marvelous and miraculous things in these spaces and making that apparent in some ways that allowed us to better theorize and better um, understand um, how digital media could function at its best, right? This is the, the best possible thing that you can do with this tool is being done in these black spaces. Um, but yeah, I, I just always think about that as we delve into these conversations about like getting back to the people and what they're posting and what their intention is with what they're posting and making sure we honor that. Yes, but that does not necessarily change uh, or shouldn't necessarily dictate the method. It, it dictates your ethical approach to your research. It, it, it dictates how you see people, and that should be an across the board no matter what method you're embarking on for that particular study. You were primed to say something, Mona? Because uh, yeah. uh, Catherine did remind me why I thought about uh, that and going back to the idea of the method. If I think about sociological methods, and then this might be, once again, just because I took intersectionality with Patricia Collins right before I did my dissertation proposal, I was looking at sociological methods and I was like, well, this is very white. Um, and it reproduces like white power structures around knowledge. Um, and I think my methodology was about making sure that I wasn't doing the same. And I think I had like an invisible, um, I guess, white professor in my head who like embodied like all the types of theory and knowledge that I didn't necessarily agree, like, agree with, like trying to corner me, right? And that's the way that I developed methodology, probably not the best way, um, but I was thinking mostly about sociology as a very white <laughs> uh, knowledge and how I would develop a methodology that troubled the way that sociology produces knowledge and reproduces white power structures when we talk about knowledge. So your comments um, touch on the latter two questions that I wanted us to talk about. Um, I think we're, we're kind of in a groove in thinking a little bit about our ethics and I wanted to hear a little bit from you about your ethics to the work, uh, your ethical approaches to the work that you're doing now and specifically what lessons have you learned working in digital spaces and again making that connection um, to the physical world to remembering that there are people with lives and feelings and the need to feel safe in as a part of your work. Talk a little bit about the ethics of uh, how your work is guided. Um, so I think I have like a similar idea about what Catherine just said about the fact that you're already in those spaces. Um, and going back to the idea that when you get into certain fields, I don't know if it, this is the same with all fields, but at least in sociology, um, they have this idea of you as a researcher being very distant from the space that you're um, studying. And I feel like the ethics of being a black woman researcher is to not deny that I am a black woman, that I am a black woman who uses social media, that I'm a black woman who uses Instagram occasionally to play thirst traps, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm not different or distinct from the groups that I am studying in uh, the way that I felt like I was trained uh, to view them. So I think my personal ethics was about 
uh, being very aware of my positionality and not trying to create this artificial distinction between me and my research subject. Um, yeah, I come from um, an English background, so part of our methodology is like, the author's dead, like <laughs> either literally or metaphorically, right? So you're just like, this is a, I'm taking this published book and like gonna mess with it. Um, and that's not necessarily something I can do with the things I collect, right? Because one, um, users aren't necessarily published authors, so they're not always expecting to be read and critiqued. Um, and yeah, and you know, sometimes it's it's good to think about the like who is writing it, right? Um, so I found that in doing this research, um, kind of my position um, and methodology as like a scholar of literature has like shifted a little bit. I like I've always liked thinking about biology, but I think it's um, doing this work has made me think about it more. Not necessarily like changing my question, but being aware of like um, kind of. Public, public utterances and who's saying them and like what um, my critique or uh, comments could reveal about something, someone that they don't want to be revealed or put them kind of on, not on blast, but um, open them up to other communities that maybe, you know, don't need to know about them or something like that, yeah. So it, it always strikes me how um, like disciplinary our approaches are to thinking about um, ethics in terms of digital research and how much of it is guided by probably the work that we did offline before some of us started doing work online, right? And so I come from a comm background, I was trained in communication, and that was sometimes about media, but that sometimes was about face-to-face -face, um, interactions and interpersonal conversations as well. And so trying to figure out as a digital researcher how much of what I'm seeing and what I'm interested in mirrors mediated communication and mirrors interpersonal face-to-face -face communication because there are different approaches that we take as communication scholars to the study of those two things. And there is this murky space in this digital realm where so much of what's happening feels very mediated, right? Like Sarah and I were having this conversation the other day, like we're, we're watching it on a screen, we're watching it play out. But so much it feels like, well, it's public. You know, people are putting things out into the world and it is a, you know, it's like watching TV, right? Like I don't have to ask Kerry Washington's permission to talk about her role on Scandal when I write about television. I do not have to call Shonda Rhimes and get her okay on anything that she has done on that show. And I get to write about it and I get to be critical and I get to be laudatory and I get to apply a theory to it and I get to do those things. And do I get to do that in the same way to people who have created public um, spaces for themselves, intentionally public spaces, right? So there are folks online who very much want everyone to see what they're doing. They are not intentionally crafting private uh, dialogue between themselves and someone else. They very much have created a brand for themselves as a public intellectual or a public figure, and much of what they tweet about or put on their blog is intentionally to be read in that way, right? But then there's, there's slippage. <laughs> and just because you have a very public facing blog that you want the world to see and that you're advertising on, doesn't mean that there aren't times when something happens mm -hmm. um, that prompts you to write a post that feels a little bit different. And the tension there is that if you're not already in that space and you don't already know that blogger's words and how they write and what happens there, you don't notice the slippage. You don't notice when it goes from being a very public, intentional, I want, the, I want the conversation, I want you to talk back to me on this, I want the challenge, this is what I'm here for, this is my public media space where I am making money and I am enjoying the interaction, to somebody just got killed today and it's weighing on me and I need to just write a thing and I don't really want that to come back at me. And you don't get that if you're not already there. Um, and so that's what's so hard to me about um, some other ways of approaching doing digital research that I don't negate as valid ways of approaching digital research, but it's why for me, I have to be in the space. It has to be so much a part of what I think and breathe each day that when the slippage happens, I know it's a slippage. That when someone needs a moment, I give them a moment. Um, and that when it's not for me to write about, it's just not for me to write about, and that's really hard as a researcher, but there was a moment a year ago that was happening on Facebook, which is a place I stay away from for the research for many, many reasons, which we can talk about, but it was like, oh, somebody should be writing about what's happening in this group. Oh my God, like this deserves all the attention, And but you know what? I'm in this group that's a private group that I was asked to be in, not for this, right, for people to do a thing. And so how would I approach an interpersonal conversation in that moment as a comm researcher? 
I would have to get permissions. I would. In that moment, I would have to ask the people that I was writing about whether it was okay to write about them. And so I don't think there's a hard and fast rule. Everything on Twitter, you have to go back and ask people their permission before you. Every blog that I've ever written about before it publishes, do I have to ask everyone before I write about their public commentary on a news site? If you commented on this article, do I have to go back and track you down and get your permission? But again, it's the slippage, it's the gray, it's the murky areas of this that make research difficult because if it wasn't difficult, everyone would do it. So we have to be willing to engage in that difficulty and that challenge and that contradiction um, within our work, apply our best practices that I think, again, we know a lot of, right? But interrogating that in this new space becomes really challenging. I heard um, each of you talk about in, in different ways, right, power and, working with attention with existing power structures and specifically what I hear a lot of and forgive me if I'm projecting onto you um, is is working with this tension of white supremacy that is in every aspect of our work right I come from a journalism background I'm a mass communication scholar and so when I think about my ethics and my ethical approach to the research uh, one I'm dealing with this tension of journalists would like to think that there is an objective reality and that they know what it is <laughs> and that they are able to be removed from the individuals whose communities they're going into whom they're quoting, who they are watching and paying attention to in order to write these stories. So how do I do work that one, lets these people know that what you're doing is not at all objective and when you step into this field, you have changed everything. Mm -hmm. um, and two, empowers the voices of the individuals with whom I am doing my work. And I think that phrase in itself yeah. kind of speaks to power, right? Because I am not researching these communities, I am participating in these communities and am a participant researcher in what I'm doing there. I'm not taking stuff out and showing it off to other people. This is what the black people are doing in these spaces online. Um, and so I, I hear a lot of, of pushback there on, on white supremacy, and I'm gonna ask this question, the devil doesn't need any more advocates, but today <laughs> I'm gonna be one. Do it. What do you do in terms of justification for your approach? Because this comes up a lot, right? Why, why would you make these choices, or why would you not make those choices, or why would you focus even on this one um, population? What do you do in terms of justification for the work that you do? I love black people, <laughs> and I, yeah. okay? No, and, and so like, I don't ever feel like it necessary to justify, well I did in graduate school, so I, I'll go back to there, right, because my, my my dissertation was about black folks online. And it was about black folks online because I, that was still at the time people were saying black folks aren't online, can't do the things, don't know how to do the things, they're not in these spaces, digital divide, right? And so there were a group of us who were like, no, black people are online. And that really was the primary <laughs> initial motivation. It was like, look at us, we are here. Um, but there was pushback at that point that was saying, um, well, you gotta compare. Maybe you can compare black folks to, I think I got like Eastern European immigrants right mm -hmm. to the states like you, you should figure out ways to make this research meaningful because mm -hmm. that's what would make it meaningful is if you took what black folks do and compared it to what white folks do or you took it uh, what black folks in the states did and compared it to what black folks in another in a part of the diaspora did or or to other immigrant populations mm -hmm. other immigrant populations right so like that was the way that people originally I think approached the research and then you get to a point at which you say the work that I'm doing all by itself is useful and important and not needing to be justified along a standard of whiteness in order to be that. Um, and I know that that's challenging, but it's only challenging in so much as people push back against me as a black person for studying black folks until I push back against them as being in dominant groups that they study. Um, and so when we start to name that most of what digital research does is study white digital practice and study white digital spaces and white folks online, and when we name it that way, then what I'm doing is not so unusual. It's not so impossible to understand that I just want to study the folks that I encounter because I see a thing happening here that actually would help you study your folks better too. Um, if you paid attention to how black folks interact with technology, you might learn a thing too about technology, as Marissa said, and what its capacities are, right? Um, so what 
we're doing matters and we have to really be okay with the fact that we're gonna have to make the pushback that what I'm doing matters as much as what you're doing, but you're just not naming that what you're doing is setting your folks too. So Catherine's on my dissertation committee. <laughs> um, and that said, she and my other uh, committee members asked me the same question about my research. Uh, and I guess I do have the benefit of that being the question as opposed to someone suggesting that I study Eastern European immigrants too. Um, and you know, they let me sit with that question, right? Like they felt like you're doing this, just explain to us why. And so uh, I think that this is where the people before me came in, doing a lot of reading of black women's intellectual production um, from various fields. And what I arrived at the conclusion was, uh, I guess what Marissa said this too, about like when you study black people, what do you learn about technology broadly? Um, and so since I'm studying black women in strip clubs, I'm also thinking about, well, what do I learn about sociology broadly when I choose black women as the unit of analysis as well as geography broadly? Um, when I choose black women as the unit of analysis and what I find is like there's black women in all these fields who've covered that for me, right? Catherine Kittrick has done demonic grounds uh, for the geography question. Shirley Ann Tate has done uh, black women's bodies in the nation for the uh, sociology piece. And so I think that's how I get away with it is the fact that black women have answered that question for me already and I can literally just quote them <laughs> instead of having to like come up with my own justification in that moment. And even so when I did do it and when I was sitting with it, I found that um, studying black women as a unit analysis does provide those unique ways. And I think I was asked the question too about white women, or not as a comparative, but rather as a tacit comparison, is that when people hear you specify one racial group, tacitly they're thinking about the other racial group. And what I found was, well, studying with black women, white women are still there, but they're disembodied, right? They are still the beauty standard. So they are found in lighter women's features. They are found in the preference for Latina dancers. Um, they are found in the fact that uh, white women and black women don't really dance in the same strip clubs, right? So I was able to use black women to answer the questions about white womanhood that I don't think I would have been able to answer if I had done a comparative analysis. Um, because basically I was saying, well, let me use black women to find the white women. Where are the black, where are the white women? Where are the, all the women really in relation to uh, black women dancers in the strip clubs? And that's when you start to realize there's lots of segregation, not only in terms of physical space, but in terms of colorism and things to that effect. Um, so I'm just grateful, I guess, for the black women who have already answered that question. And because they answered that question, I was able to go to my data and see the things that they said, it, said I would find. Yeah, I think I'm lucky in that respect too because people are already um, doing this work, including Marissa, right? Like um, black people have always been technological and people keep saying that enough that my dissertation advisors were like, oh yes, I think we've heard that before. <laughs> so what is your approach, right? Like, So like I have this whole apparatus of Afrofuturism, people who are doing black technological studies and I'm just like, here, I'm gonna throw a bunch of books at you and this is why it's important. So I think I'm lucky in that respect and that I get to do the work that I'm doing because like I know black people have always been technological and you probably know that black people have always been technological but then I'll like sit down next to someone and they'll be like but why is Finn in Star Wars like why is there a black like why are there black people in these like futuristic productions in Hollywood and I'm like no 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 like we need to like go back like right so and I think that's usually what like the work I've been doing like I've just trying to be louder than like popular representations of the future that always seemingly always exclude black people and you're like no but come on like really <laughs> um so yeah <laughs> that's really that's really my justification for my work like i want to see me because i'm already there right um catch up <laughs> so and <laughs> to like connect it back to tools too i think um for most of the time I've been studying um, digital culture, digital life, I've been looking at places that were not Twitter um, because at the moment when I started studying, there were a lot of folks studying Twitter and there are even more folks studying Twitter now. And I think Twitter's interesting too and I like to play play on Twitter too. 
Um, but I did. I have not thus far until this current book project done a lot with research on Twitter. Uh, not because I don't think it's valuable, but because I just think there are these other valuable spaces that the research was missing and that the tools don't catch in that way. Um, so like the blogosphere, for example, um, you know, people studied 15 to 20 years ago and were kind of done with. And I was like, but I'm not done. <laughs> like I, I was still you know, using blog, there were some really important critical places of black gathering spaces for me um, that really mirrored the kind of black gathering spaces offline in ways that felt more um, tangible than Twitter did at the time, right? This is actually how I gather and have conversations more than I was on Twitter at that moment. Um, but there aren't tools to like catch that, right? And so when I was um, even looking for black blogs to study, you couldn't use some of the more popular tools for like archiving blogs and searching blogs. You couldn't like type in all the black blogs. It, that's not how it worked, right? And so it was like about knowing and knowing the networks of people. And so I know this blogger and I know that they follow these three bloggers. And so their blogs are probably kind of similar in tone or in this way. But I know this other blogger who writes about this other thing that I know maybe from Twitter, right? Or maybe from some other space or maybe in real life. Um, and so it was doing that kind of work to gather those spaces. Um, that I couldn't do with a hashtag, right? Like I couldn't collect that. And I'm reminded of like Sarah Florini's work with, with podcasts, right? And how you can't, you know, do a quick search and find what everybody said in the podcast and it's not transcribed for you. And so thinking about like the tools and how they evolve and how they can make life um, easier in some ways um, to capture some things, um, but the things that they leave out if we haven't thought down that path yet or how we can even play with and push some of the tools we have now to capture other kinds of spaces um, that are outside of that Twitter universe. Um, and so what would it look like to start thinking about the transcription of, of uh, talk from podcasts or to be able to use text encoding to think about what's happening in the blogosphere and kind of do some TEI work with that? Like, what would it mean to do that? What would it take away from what my ability is to do um, in doing deep dives and discourse analysis, which is what I'm trained to do, right? I'm trained to do rhetorical analysis and discourse analysis. And what would that look like differently using tools? What new avenues of research would it enable? And which ones would it close down? Um, and that's something that I'm thinking about a lot this year working with the, the Ad Hume Project at Maryland is what, what new questions can I ask, which is really exciting, and which questions are there no way to answer without like, so far, um, without like that, like, oh, let me just archive the things and spend hours reading the things and figuring out where the themes connect and doing the grounded theory, yeah, you know. Mm -hmm. That's, um, you actually previewed question three because that's where we were going. Um, asking about justification is a question that links us back to appraisal, right? What information, what data, what sites, what sources, what people, what voices do we privilege in the decision-making process? So what do I need as a researcher? What do you need as a researcher? And what do we value? And then how does that speak to the tools that are being developed or the tools that we need to be developed? Because in, in your case, Catherine, right, you can use maybe something like the Wayback Machine to reproduce a blog that was, you know, you're missing some pages from or it's really hard to find now on the internet, but when you think about stepping back into justification, and that being the way that you make decisions, and then speaking to people who are developing these tools, and my hat's off to all of you because I could never come up with any of this stuff, um, I want to ask about what tools do you need that do not exist? What do you need them to do? And how do you need to use them? So if you're going to be user cases for all the folks in the room, all the technologists in the room, what do you need? And how do you want to use it? Am I going first on that? <laughs> so me specifically, I think I can thank Ed um, and Myth generally for teaching me a lot about open source software. Um, so for my project right now, Instagram is a little bit different uh, than Twitter um, in terms of how they handle their data. Uh, Instagram has this thing called sandbox mode, which uh, you can use uh, to pull data initially, but you actually have to create a terms of service if you want to get full access to the data. And generally, you don't just arbitrarily create terms of service, right? Like terms of service are usually for a software or a website. And it's like, well, I'm not going to do all that. <laughs> um, so there's a service that I can use called Pico Dash, which uh, communicates with the Instagram API and has a terms of service, but that too is a paid service. So what I need is some open source, free access to Instagram data. Um, and I think I remember Ed talking about uh, some of the 
changes to the Twitter API and how archivists had to advocate uh, for certain things to be kept um, because these pro uh, these companies rather, right? So we should think about them as companies now instead of just software, aren't thinking about us as researchers and they don't necessarily desire to uh, reach out to us or communicate with us, right? So if you go to Instagram, I don't know about Twitter, but if you go to Instagram, um, they don't really have ethics. And if you go to Twitter, their ethics are about business, right? Which business ethics are completely different um, from what you would use as researchers. So I think another thing I would like also is a standardized practice of ethical um, approaches. Uh, granted, I think going back to what um, Catherine said is like each thing that you do would require different approaches. But I think it would just make me more comfortable as a scholar to know that my practices of digital research match up to some existing framework. Um. Yeah, I think I agree with you definitely about the standardization um, because I've, um, again, literature scholar, I was like, oh, I was talking to a bunch of people and I was like, oh yes, I need to think about like users. And then that just spent me on like two, two weeks of like deep research. I was like, how, how, who's writing about this? Burgess was writing about it. So that was really helpful. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, that and, I can't think of any like specific tools, but if you could all come to my house and just stay with me all the time. <laughs> um, yeah, um, community gatherings like this are very helpful um, for someone who is doing this work and I really like hearing from everyone. So yeah, just come on by. It's really small, but you could fit. <laughs> That's a tough question. Um, things that I need are to be able to still, uh, we said this, uh, see the data as, as it existed before it was stockpiled, right? So like I have to be able to see the tweet in context. Um, I have to be able to see the, the comment or the reply in context, like of when it happened and what happened before it and what happened after it and what the interaction was between those users prior to them interacting on that occasion and like were they liking everything that somebody posted or were they liking the one thing that somebody posted. And so there's a lot of things that I need to be able to see about like what it looked like on that page in relation to what the interface looked like. If it's a blog, I need to be able to not just have the words from it, which is what I often run into with the challenge of doing um, text and discourse analysis in the blogosphere is that like I need to see how the blog looked, which is the Wayback Machine is really helpful for, right? But I need to be able to see like what I had to do to in order to comment on that. Did I have to set up an account? What were the options for me in setting up my username? Because those things matter in terms of what kind of comments I leave in certain kinds of places. Do I have to add a picture in order to do it? Do I have to log in to be able to comment? Um, how often can I change my avi? Do I have to keep it the same for a period of time? Like on Facebook, if I change my name, do I have to keep that name for a long period of time or can I change it every day? Like if I have a new idea about what my name should be on Twitter, right? So those kind of features of the platform um, are really important. I think will become increasingly important as people study platforms that become more outdated. Um, and so the ways that we can model and replicate what the platforms looked like at that time in conjunction with the data that we pull from it is really useful um, because the way that blogs looked four years ago that I still study now are entirely different. Their ad revenue structure is different. Some of them have shifted platforms. Some of them have shifted contributors, et cetera, et cetera. And all of those things matter. Um, but I think it matters similarly in, in some of our work with Twitter, Twitter as well. So oftentimes, and this is where it gets to, it kind of does matter what people are doing with it, right? So do I use TweetDeck when I watch Twitter? Yes, I do. And so what other things are happening next to and in front of and behind? And what, what does that change about how I interact with folks on that platform, what I'm seeing? before and behind them. And if I do want to retweet somebody, do I get to go to their page and look at what they've done previously? So like, there's all of these complexities, right? That um, again, like living in that moment allows you to get some of, not all still, right? But allows me to kind of ask questions in the moment as they come up to me. I'm really curious about why this person did this thing. Let me look at what they did before that. Let me look at who they just retweeted and how they got that news story originally before they quote tweeted it or screenshotted it instead of retweeted it, right? Because screenshotting it instead 
of retweeting it is making some comment about them not wanting to give somebody a retweet, right? And so all of those things kind of matter. Um, and I don't know how the tools capture all of them because we are capturing some of those uh, uh, at the same time, but the extent to which the tools allow us to annotate as we collect data is really important and they allow us to make notes to ourselves as we are pulling that stream and I can say, here's I'm watching it while the stream is also archiving it and I can make notes about what I'm seeing. So that ability is really useful and a lot of those things are already built into um, this platform and into DocNow and the work that they're doing. So that's some stuff. <laughs> My short answer to that would be, um, I need things that help me better visualize communities. Um, my work focuses on communities and community conversation, and even if these are communities that are, uh, that I am a researcher am defining, right, because every single user in these spaces defines their own community for themselves, but if I have found, in my work I, I talk about thematic nodes, if I found a thematic node of, say, black feminism, and I want to see who's coming back to this topic again and again, there may not be a hashtag. Um, there may not be people linking to one another. There could be people talking past each other on purpose, but they're still a part of this community conversation on black feminism. And so I'm looking for ways to bring these communities together that moves beyond something like a, a Node XL where everyone's talking about the same thing at the same time, um, and even being able to create those communities myself, like, all right, so these 10 individuals I know often have really, they get off these hot tweets early in the morning when I can't be up watching Twitter. <laughs> and so I need to be able to put them together and see what the discourse looks like between them when these certain news events happen. So things that allow me to envision community, to shape community, um, just in terms of data points, and then to analyze from that. That said, it is 12 o'clock and we have 15 minutes for questions, so this is a conversation. We wanna turn it over to folks on the other side there who have questions. Questions. <laughs> and, and I'm sorry, one, one deliberate choice I'm gonna make. Um, I am going to start, and I you know issue this challenge to people when you, you have the opportunity to curate conversation. Pass the mic to a woman. Let a woman speak first. So. Well, first of all, thank you all. This was amazing. I will be continuing our starting relationships with all of you. Um, so personally, I have an interest in Instagram. Um, and so I'm interested in how you, I mean, you spoke to some of the challenges you have, but I'm interested in how you opened up Instagram, because again, it doesn't work similarly to Twitter, and like the hashtags aren't visible, and I know you all kind of spoke to being present, because um, like I'm personally interested in practices of witchcraft among Afro-Latinx communities, and unless you're there, you can't really see. So I'm just really interested in how you're finding these communities and how you kind of bracketed your, your data set and figured that out. Um, that's a good question. So the way that I get at the data is through the service Pico Dash, which was intentional about knowing that uh, researchers, academics would want to use Twitter uh, or Instagram. And so they created the service for that, right? Like for instance, if you wanted to search a hashtag on witchcraft, you could search the hashtag and export the data into a file. Um, as far as how I found what I was looking for, um, this was about, I guess, my methodology and the choice that I made to include the strip cub as a unit of analysis. So, I, you know, being a black woman raised in Atlanta, I was like, let's look for strokers down the street. Um, and the service allows you to search for things by location and uh, change the parameters so that your, I think about within 100 meters of the actual location you're looking for and then look at pictures just tagged there, right? And so a lot of this is relying on the good faith of the people who use Instagram uh, to, I guess, engage in the tools that Instagram provides, right? So of course that makes it difficult, which means women who are strippers who, d who don't use those uh, tools, uh, I can't study, right? Like for instance, if they decide to make their account private, I can't study them. Um, so that was the way to, that made it, I guess, simpler for me was thinking about, uh, how someone uses, uh, social media in space. 
um, not just independent. Because I think Twitter, when I did Twitter research, I wasn't as cognizant of space, um, right? But I guess Instagram, because you literally take pictures of places, kind of uh, guides you to do that. Um, and then you look at the language that the people use to talk about themselves, uh, right? So I noticed that on Instagram, dancers use hashtags to kind of communicate to the subculture of other dancers. I'm not gonna throw those hashtags out there for you guys. Um, but once I was able to say, okay, these dancers like to use these hashtags to communicate with each other, uh, you can find other dancers that way. And then I think I made an intentional decision about when I was gonna define a woman as a dancer, which was <laughs> right now for me, I, I'm calling it iconic in um, the locker room picture, right? <laughs> so when dancers tag themselves in the locker room, which without Instagram is typically backstage, um, I'm aware like, okay, you are revealing to me that you want to see me as a dancer or you want me to see you as a dancer. And then I choose to follow those women based on that. So uh, the way that I guess I'm doing it is kind of inferring from the way that they present themselves online that they want me to interpret them as that, right? So if they put dancer in their biography, they want me to see them as a dancer. Um, and I've also made sure then that women who don't seem to have that same practice, I don't include. So for instance, a strip club might tag you as a dancer, but when I go to your pri profile, you're just a college student, right? So I'm not gonna include you uh, in my analysis because you yourself don't seem to want to be portrayed as such. Even, in, even though as a researcher, <laughs> I can say, hey, this strip club tagged you in the locker room. Um, so it's a lot of, I guess, negotiating how people portray themselves and how I as a researcher can make use of that. And I think I'm just really interested in making sure that ultimately this is about how they choose to self-define because I want to talk to them specifically about why they do what they do and what that means to them. So if I'm getting the sense that dancing might be peripheral to your identity, I'm not going to include you in the analysis. Thank you. Can we pass the mic to the front? Thank you. Um, uh, it's really a fascinating panel. I'm, I'm learning so much. Uh, so um, my question is, you know, wow, I have a defect on this mic. <laughs> um, so uh, more and more when you do research, uh, particularly if you're trying to get research grant money, they require that you deposit your research data to a repository and with an assumption that you will share the data. I just wonder how you could navigate that on issues like this where the whole point of the research is not necessarily to share the data but to find enrichment and meaningful uh, analysis. talk really briefly about one thing that we did, um, and I'll just say this briefly. The Beyond the Hashtags report, which was led by Dean Freelon, who's now at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, go Heels. Um, we, we had a data set of like 41 million tweets from uh, the Black Lives Matter movement over a, a little over a year. And one of the conditions of agreement was that we would make the data available after we purchased it, but we embargoed it for a year so that you know there's there's an opportunity for people if they don't want to be surveilled in the data, they can go and delete their their Twitter um, their tweets, anything that they they put out there. So that was one of the the approaches that we take. I would think thinking a little bit further about it, um, I would probably consider, you know, STEM data as in like a, a short piece of data that I would be willing to share, but there might be some things that I would that I would hold back. Like for instance, with that project, uh, we said it's open source, but I won't give up the interview data from it. I think Ed's twerk tool helps with this with Twitter as far as like using IDs. Um, and so I think it kind of puts the onus on the researcher to make that data visible. So there's ways and there's tools that have been created that kind of, yes, it's a public repository, but it's not Instagram 2.0 where you're going to go on there and literally look at the data. 
I'm only responsible for making it accessible, not necessarily readable. <laughs> so I think like there are practices you can do to like, I guess, obscure access while still actually giving access. Just kind of a, a similar question, I think, following up on that then, um, if anyone had uh, any experience uh, being challenged from an IRB standpoint then, as far as what they could or could not collect, how they could preserve it, how they could share it, and anything you learned from that? Do you, I know you have Go, things yes, to I say. Have, I have, I have, I have thoughts. deep in my heart. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I guess this is the time to make a pitch for potential collaborators because I do think, um, as we were talking about ethical practices earlier, right, and wanting to be able to, to reach back to a framework that exists, um, there is a need in the field for boilerplate, for directions, and I know that this is starting to be produced. I think the University of Pennsylvania has a guide up on how to navigate some of this, but it really has to do with data collection and not necessarily educating the IRB. Um, th so there are a couple of things about working with IRB that I would pass on. And one is to remind them, very clearly demonstrate, that there is nothing that is created online that is absent a person. That this is human subjects research. And by that, I'm going to take into consideration some of the same things that we think about in terms of privacy, um, in terms of making sure that someone is not harmed by the research that I'm doing. At the same time, with a number of the platforms that we use online, there are terms of service that can be worked into the IRB language that help people who are reading these applications understand that what I'm doing is not necessarily um, using identify, identifying information or something that would cause someone to be thrust into a spotlight that they did not want to be in, right? As a researcher, I am making specific decisions to make sure that I'm not exposing the populations that I'm working with to harm. And I think we're probably doing a really good job of that as researchers but the IRB does not necessarily know what they need to be looking for in applications uh, so that they can say, no, here's a consideration that you need to make, or have you asked yourself these questions about what happens to the data while you're collecting it, after you're collecting it, and uh, what recourse you give to your participants if um, their, their data is part of your data set and the way that it's used. So I would just say that the IRB is a thing that's at, you know that you have to go through but it is not the thing that I use to guide any of my thinking about how I interact with um, my research frankly um, because I don't think most IRBs at most institutions have any sense of what we're doing um, and you know quite frankly the committees are not in a position to dictate to me things that they don't know the things about so we all know ways to get around I mean like I can get you know I, I really have never had to go through an IRB process for a lot of what I've had to do I've, I've gotten waivers on almost all of it because it's not human subject research it's publicly available mediated data right and so there's ways you can you can just not deal with the IRB what I and I mean you no, that's not what I'm saying <laughs> it's live stream no, don't I run everything through the IRB as I am institutionally bound to do ethical reasons. No, but my point is this: there are there are bodies who who have been thinking about this a long time. I will point us to the AOIR Code of Ethics on in, on if, on ethical research on digital um, studies, um, and these are not by any means things that are hard and fast that people have to follow. But these are brilliant minds who have been doing internet research for a very long time and thinking about these issues for a very long time. So I do encourage folks who are on the newer side to doing this to think about this that as not something new and that no one has encountered quite yet. Mm -hmm. um, and that there are uh, ethical decision-making practices and best practices and people who share stories about what has worked and what hasn't. And I will also say, I think that there is this spectrum of ethics um, that people I know who do really good research fall on. And there are folks I know who I think do phenomenal research who are on one side of things and are like, they put it on Twitter, mm -hmm. their Twitter's public, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna use it because it's public. 
Um, but they're really ethical folks. It's not like they're out there seeking to harm people, right? So I want to pair those two things together, right? That there is this personal ethic of like the research I'm doing is for the purpose of X and is not for the exposure and the harm and the hate, right? And some of them would argue very vehemently that anonymizing data is problematic because it is taking away um, what people have worked hard to craft, right? Like this is a statement that you made publicly that is your statement and that like I want to give you credit for and this is me not citing you for this brilliant thing you said because when I'm writing about what black women write that's really brilliant online that's their stuff and I want to make sure that they know it's not my stuff I didn't think that up someone else wrote that and someone else did that so there is this spectrum right all the way to the point of like I don't do anything before I ask I don't publish anything before I ask I don't even think about writing things I, I co-write with everyone right and that spectrum is okay to be on if we are actually doing the thinking of it right and this is what I emphasize in, in grad seminars on, on method is that like it's the thinking that's important right and not the afterward like getting away with right like how can I make sure that what I did was actually okay as far as IRB standards how can I skirt whatever rules or regulations are in place it's the thinking on the front side of it who am I as a researcher what am I trying to accomplish accomplish here? What is the end goal of my research? Is it to get me tenure? Is it to get me tenure and to be a good citizen and to provide actual, you know, is it to be an activist scholar? Is it to do things that actually upend and uproot and disrupt? What am I trying to do here? And is the way that I'm going about approaching it actually meeting that end? And so that was a lot to say The AYR has a code of ethics that I think everybody should read because it's pretty good. <laughs> If there are no other questions, it is exactly 1215, so we thank you for your time.